Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, July 2024, the evening of the 4th of July, the eve of the 4th of July, I should say. Um, it's pretty warm here in Baltimore, about 87. Uh, Orioles fans will know the Orioles are on the road. Um, so welcome. A couple quick announcements is, number one, our Baltimore Chop newsletter should be out excuse me, within the next couple of days, um, a couple more articles to submit. So be on the lookout for that. Our uh, peeps at the peep call in August, originally supposed to be August 7th, um, will have to be moved to a different day because August 7th is the first day of the um, convention in Minnesota. So don't want anything to, basically the Sabre uh, Zoom won't be, use that night because it'll be recording uh, all of the convention stuff. So um, our August 7th will likely be moved to July 31st or to August 14th, depending upon availability. Um, other than that, we're pretty much booked for the rest of the year, uh, both with uh, the Baltimore Babel and uh, Peeps of the Peeb um, through December. So um I guess I'm thankful that we're very popular and people want to be um, part of our uh, discussions here in, in Baltimore. Um, administratively, the only other thing I will need to mention is for those of you who live uh, in the Maryland area and come to our annual um, Sabre event at Camden Yards, it's going to be the last home game of the year. Um, which is on a Sunday in September against the Tigers. Uh, can't remember the exact day, but that'll be our, um, there'll be a pregame party in the warehouse. And then uh, it's a 1.30 game against uh, Detroit, unless they change the time. So um, that's it for me at this point. Uh, thanks everybody for, for being here. I know it's a, it's a holiday for pretty much everybody starting tomorrow. Um, people go out of town, go to the beach, that kind of thing. So um, I'm going to introduce Don, who I believe is joining us from Illinois, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's been a Sabre member oh, quite a long time, since 79. Um, before he retired in 2016, uh, he spent more than two decades with Stats LLC, first as a director of publications, and then as the director of research for television broadcasts. So far, he's also the author of The Legendary Harry Carey, Baseball's Greatest Salesman, and Double Plays and Double Crosses, The Black Sox and Baseball in 1920, as well as the editor of the Sabre book, Go Go to Glory, the 1959 Chicago White Sox. Tonight, he's here to talk to us about his next book, which will be coming out next spring um, by University of Illinois Press, entitled Justice Batted Last, Ernie Banks, Minnie Minoso, and the unheralded players who integrated Chicago's major league teams. Um, so great to have you with us, Don. Um, you have co-host capability, so if you have any presentations, uh, go right ahead, and we'll uh, talk to you at, at the end. Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay, no. Okay, so what do I do? I'm gonna make you a co-host. Okay. Okay. Now you should be able to share your screen anytime. Okay. Or can you see the screen? Anybody see it? I can't. Okay. So I'm not sure what I should do. I can see I can see your picture in the right hand corner in the corner. So Don, do you see a button mark share down on the bottom? It's a green button with an arrow that's pointing up. Uh <laughs> I do not, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get off and get back on again right away. So <clears throat> bear with me here. Pete, can you make him a co-host? I already did. Huh. Um, you know, I'm, I, I see, 
I see Peter's uh, face, but I, I don't see anything else. Whoa, you, need to, you need to move the cursor to see the things on the bottom. You have to move the cursor down there. Okay. Okay, you know, I, I don't see anything. Um, what? I don't know what I did, but I can't get back. When I, I, I can't get back to Zoom, it seems like, unless I quit. Why don't you exit and come back in? Okay, I'm going to do that. Well, hi, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good crowd for a uh, night before a uh, holiday. Not too bad. Not too bad. I'm on hiatus, so I can I can duck in on meetings and 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 be a little bit more rested. Are you, How you feeling, feeling, Bruce? Feeling? What's that, Pete? How you feeling, Bruce? I'm doing great. I'm I'm able to to um um get around much better. I'm you know I'm I'm I've got a slight limp, a little hitch in my walk, but I'm 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 feeling really good. Thanks for asking. <laughs> I, I will be at in Minneapolis. Even though I have to pay, unlike Francis, who rigged the contest and won a bunch of free trips for crying out loud. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I will say I haven't told too many people in savor this, but actually I'm going to have to miss the me miss the convention this year um, due to a health issue. Oh my gosh! I'm sorry. I, I I was I was teasing. I'm sorry. Oh my god. Yeah. No. Uh, I uh, I've I, I talked with people you know who had that uh, thing. They they graciously said that the uh, the five years can begin next year. But uh, oh, that's I, nice. That's good. Just not, Excellent. It's good not that's just good enough for me to travel right now. That's good. Well, you need to feel better, and I'm going to be quiet because Doc back. No, yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, I'm done. Um, my meeting. So <laughs> I'll be letting some people know in Saber who you would expect to see me there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I've talked to my doctor, and they don't think it'd be good for me to get on an airplane and oh. you know get out right now. All right, I'm back. Um, with any luck, this will work. So I see share. Yeah, you sure did. Full share. I gave you your full host now. Okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, you anybody, can I can. I you can. No. Can you? No. Nope. So this is going to sound ridiculous, but somehow I wound up as with host privileges. So I just made Dot a co-host. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Ah, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So can you you see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yep. yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you. We are cooking. Thank you. So uh, I want to say a little bit more about myself. I'm actually in Los Angeles, not in Chicago. I. I'm a, a lifelong uh, Chicago boy until 25 years ago when I moved to Los Angeles for the stats business. Um, a big part of the business was uh, we were the research group for Fox television broadcast sports. So we did the baseball postseason. We did the Super Bowl. We did a lot of stuff for them. And that's how I ended up out in L.A. But I am still a Chicago guy through and through, uh, suffering through another wonderful season with the White Sox. <laughs> I don't want your pity, but uh, I'll take it. I'm right there with you, Don. All right. We uh, offer it anyway. <laughs> now, when, I for, when I worked for Stats, um, one of the things that we did was we White Sox were a big client of ours. And on a couple of occasions, 
uh, when Minnie Minoso was uh, up for the Hall of Fame Veterans Committee, they asked me to uh, put together a kind of statistical argument uh, for Minnie's candidacy and his qualifications for the Hall. And uh, I actually met Minnie through that. Uh, he was a wonderful man. And I became fascinated by his life and uh, just his journey and all the things that he went through and all the things that he had to endure uh, to become a major league player and uh, um, to move from Cuba to the United States and establish himself. It's, it's really quite an inspiring story. So I started with the idea of, of doing a book about many, but then I thought I would expand it to um, do it about the integration of the Cubs and the White Sox um, because the, the first black player for the Cubs was Ernie Banks, who was obviously a very notable player and uh, somebody who had a, an extremely interesting life. So I kind of started with them. And uh, as I expanded more and more, I, I got into the players um, who played in the majors with the Cubs and the White Sox, early black players, but also the guys who were in the minor leagues who came up through the system uh, most of whom never never even reached the majors, but they were a big part of the story as well. So uh, anyway, that was the kind of the gestation for the book. And uh, that's how I got started. So one of the questions that I had was, Chicago has a really proud history of black baseball. Um, the Negro National League was founded by uh, Rube Foster in 1920. Um, his team was the Chicago American Giants. They won the first two Negro National League pennants. They were a league power for, for decades. Rube Foster himself was president of the league for a number of years. Um, 13 players who wore the American Giants uniforms were elected to a Hall of Fame either in the US or Latin America. So it was really quite a distinguished team. And that team really lasted in, into the 1950s. Um, another big thing about Chicago and black baseball was that it was primarily the site of the annual East-West All-Star game, which was played every summer. And it was a huge game, and not only in black baseball, but in baseball in general. And it was really black baseball's premier event. And along with that, along with the baseball itself, there were a lot of very good and very powerful and, and qualified black writers like Sam Lacey in particular. Sam eventually relocated to Baltimore, but he was with the Chicago Defender for a long time. And they not only wrote about black baseball, but they started to push the idea of getting black players into white major league baseball. This really began uh, seriously in the 1930s. And uh, Sam Lacey was very much one of the people behind that. So they really had high hopes that Phil Wrigley, who was owner of the Cubs, would be the first owner to integrate his team. Now, Wrigley in the 19, late 1930s, early 1940s was still a relatively young man. He really considered himself very progressive um, in his day-to-day -day life and in his work business as well. He ran the Wrigley Gum Company and he prided himself on having a large number of black employees in his business. Um, and he felt that he gave them opportunities to advance. And he really thought that, people really thought that the Cubs were a very promising team to be the first to integrate. So in December of 1942, the uh, uh, Negro League, uh, uh, the Negro Press Association arranged an interview with Wrigley and a active black activist named William L. Patterson. Now Patterson was a communist. Uh, he was very outspoken, uh, a labor leader, very much interested in racial justice and justice for all people. And he was also very interested in baseball. So the uh, Negro Press Association set up an interview between Wrigley and William L. Patterson. And it was, it was really a 
well covered interview. And in the course of the meeting, um, Wrigley said that he felt that integration was coming, that black players were going to be in the big, big, big league soon, but he didn't think the time was now. And one of the things he said was that he was afraid that some fights would take place if a colored player got into it with a white player. And he said he was afraid of a riot. But nonetheless, he thought it was going to be coming in the next few years. So he had a subsequent meeting with Patterson a couple months after this interview. And at this meeting, he agreed to let Black players try out for his premier farm team, which was the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League. So the players took him at his word. And several months later, in the spring of 1943, um, four players showed up to try out for the Angels, and they were shot down. Uh, Pants Rowland uh, was one of Wrigley's um, main assistants, and he ran the LA Angels franchise. And his excuse was, listen, there's a war going on. The minor leagues are in decline. I got to worry about jobs for my white players. So sorry, guys, I can't give you a tryout. One of the black players who was turned away was a pitcher, a Negro leaguer named Nat Moreland, Nate Moreland. And Nate's comment was, I can play in Mexico, but I can't play in America where I'm serving in the, in the armed services. And he was really outraged about that. So at any rate, <clears throat> they didn't get to try out. So in the meantime, Wrigley, again, he's, he's kind of open to the idea of integration, or at least he says he is. In 1942, in particular, he has a couple of games with Black players at Wrigley Field that both featured Satchel Page. Uh, one of them was against the Dizzy Dean All-Stars. Uh, the other game was against the he was pitching for a black team against the Kansas City Monarchs. And both games drew huge crowds to Wrigley, you know, like, like 25, 30,000 people or more. And the attendance at those games dwarfed what the White Sox were drawing across town for an American League game. And Wrigley and others could really see the opportunity for black baseball. And again, he seemed to be open to the idea. But then in 1945, there was a Negro League game at Wrigley Field. During the game, a fight, fight breaks out. Um, there's between a player and an umpire. And there's all kinds of pandemonium uh, in the stands and on the field. And the police have to come. And this is basically Phil Wrigley's worst nightmare. So he not only cools completely to the idea of baseball integration with black players coming into the major leagues, but he jacks up the, the asking price for black Negro League teams to play at Wrigley Field, makes the cost so prohibitively high that there's never again a Negro League game at Wrigley Field. And uh, Wrigley goes in the opposite direction and the Cubs don't have a black player even in the minor leagues until 1949. On the other side of town, the White Sox also had an opportunity, if not to integrate, at least to give a trial to a promising black player. And that black player was Jackie Robinson. When Jackie was at Pasadena Junior College in 1948, the White Sox were training in Pasadena. So they had a spring training game with the Pasadena Junior College team facing the White Sox. And Robinson was great. He had a couple hits. He started in the field. Uh, he ran crazy on the, on the base pass. And he made the, look, the White Sox look pretty bad. And Jimmy Dykes was managing the White Sox at the time. And he was quoted in uh, stories that were covered in the Pittsburgh Courier and other black uh, publications saying that Jackie Robinson was worth $50,000 of anybody's money 
But of course, we're not allowed to sign a player like that. So now 1942, a few years later, a Pittsburgh Courier reporter named Herman Hill, who was both a writer and an activist, decides to bring Robinson and three other Black players, including the, the, Nate Moreland, the same guy who would be turned away by the LA Angels, for a tryout to the White Sox camp in Pasadena. According to Hill, Dykes blushed when Robinson came on the diamond. He refused to pose for pictures with the players, and several White Sox players hovered around menacingly with bats in their hands. There was, of course, no tryout. Uh, you may at, at times read stories about Jackie Robinson's tryout with the White Sox. There was no tryout. They came in, but they were sent away. And the White Sox did not integrate even in the minor leagues until 1950. And that was long after Jimmy Dykes was gone from the team. But he will come up in the story later. So finally in 1949, <clears throat> by this time, uh, the Dodgers had integrated. Um, the St. Louis Browns had briefly integrated in 1947 and then released their black players. The Cleveland Indians had integrated and then in the spring of 1949, the New York Giants integrated. But there were about, uh, I think, about eight major league teams that were admitting Black players into their farm system. So the Cubs, as kind of a, a first step, um, admitted a few Black players, signed a few Black players to their farm teams. And the first guy that they signed was a guy named Charles Pope who was a Californian. He lived in um, a place called Tulare, which is uh, around Fresno, um, raisin country, farming country. And um, Pope had grown up in that area. And Pope had an interesting background. He had originally um, come from a family um, that had lived in um, a town called Boley, Oklahoma. And Bowley, Oklahoma was a, a, a black community that was designed to be a self-sufficient black community with their own banks, businesses, stores, everything to make the black community self-sufficient. Um, that became very popular and successful in Oklahoma. The same thing happened in California. And when, when Pope's family, who were farmers, ran into difficulty with their business in Oklahoma, they moved to California and they moved to another um, self-sufficient black community in California called Allingsworth. And uh, that's where Charles Pope grew up. He, he actually went to the high school um, in this um, black community. Um, he eventually transferred um, to an integrated high school in Tulare, and uh, he was a promising player. He played. Um, it would he would played for a a minor league black minor league Barnstormy team called the San Francisco Cubs. Um, did quite well, and he was actually signed by this Cubs farm team as the first black player in the Cubs system. Um, he was assigned to the team in Visalia, California which is only about 15 miles away from Tulare. So he's a local boy. Um, there's a lot of publicity about him trying out for this team. Um, he's a catcher, switch hitting catcher. He catches a shutout on opening day. But after that, he's kind of in and out of the lineup. The team starts becoming cool toward his talents. Uh, in the first 50 or so games of the season, he plays in only 21 of them. He actually does quite well. He has a 375 on base percentage. Um, he has a little bit of difficulty in the field, but he's also nursing a sore arm, which they knew about. But less than two months into the season, the Vasily Cubs um, release Charles Pope. And I was actually able to talk to Pope's granddaughter, uh, who still lives in that same area. And she was actually raised by Charles Pope. 
And she told me that Charles was very outspoken, didn't take guff from anybody, wasn't afraid to talk back. And um, kind of the insinuation was that he was a little bit too strong a personality for a black player in 1949. So he was let go. But Pope had company. The Vicente Cubs actually signed two other black players. They signed a pitcher named Ken Taylor, who was Pope's battery mate with the San Francisco Cubs um, barnstorming team, and a Negro League pitcher named Walt McCoy. None of these guys lasted more than two months. Um, they were gone by, by mid June. In the 1949 season, the Cubs actually signed a total of eight black players for their minor league teams. None of them ever came close to reaching the majors, and only a couple of them uh, even were brought back in 1950. And some of these players were, were really incredible athletes and extremely talented people. A guy I became interested in was a guy named Billy Hart. Um, he was a, a New Englander, uh, grew up in uh, Williamstown, Massachusetts. He was only like 5'6", five, 5'7", five, um, but he was a brilliant three-sport athlete both there and at a college in uh, in, in Vermont. Um, and he, he was a well-known athlete in that area. So he signs with the Cubs farm team in Sioux Falls, South Dakota in August. It's kind of the same story as Charles Pope. They play him in 12 games the rest of the season, decide, no, we don't want this guy. <clears throat> so he's released. Hart actually gets another chance in spring training in 1950, but <clears throat> I talked to his daughter and his daughter told me that Hart had to go to spring training in, in, Flor in Georgia in 1950. And he brought his wife, this was their first experience with Jim Crow. <clears throat> and they were just horrified by what they ran into. And eventually, <clears throat> he just retired from baseball. But he didn't retire from athletics. Um, <clears throat> he went to Korea, um, won all kinds of honors during the Korean War. Then he came back, became a semi-pro basketball player for a team that was so good that they actually defeated the Boston Celtics on one occasion, uh, one praise from Bob, Bob Cousy. He became a, a great tennis player, uh, was voted into the New England Sports uh, Tennis Hall of Fame. And uh, in the 1990s, um, when the county that he came up from um, gave, gave a list of their greatest athletes in the history of the county, Billy Hart was second on the list. He was an amazing athlete, but apparently he was not good enough to play for the Chicago Cubs or even for their Class C farm team. On the south side of town, <clears throat> the White Sox had been a very conservative organization and also a very bad organization. <clears throat> Nothing new there. But in 1948, they hire Frank Lane as their general manager, and they hire Paul Richards as their manager two years later. <clears throat> now, when, when Lane comes in, he shows interest in signing Black players. He talks about purchasing, um, in particular, he was interested in Sam Jethro, and Don Newcomb, who were playing in the Dodgers farm team. Um, he decides the Dodgers want too much, too much money for guys like that. But in the meantime, the White Sox are shelling out over a quarter of a million dollars to, in bonuses to white high school players, <laughs> basically none of whom ever reached the major leagues. Like the, the biggest star among this group of, of white bonus players that were signed by the White Sox was a guy named J.W. Porter, uh, 
I have his baseball card and it's not worth any money because his career, his career didn't really last very long. <laughs> so finally in, in 19, before the 1951 season, he hired Richards as the manager. Now Richards had managed in the Pacific Coast League in 1950 at Seattle. And that year, he had seen Minnie Minoso play for the Cleveland Indians farm team in San Diego. And he liked what he saw. Richards was a guy who loved defense. He loved base running. He loved guys who could create havoc for the other team. And he was very interested in signing Minnie Minoso. And he recommended the signing of of the of having Wayne try to make a trade with the Indians. Um, Richards is an interesting character when it comes to his relationship with black players. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. But at the time, he was very interested in adding black players to the White Sox, and in particular, adding Minoso to the White Sox team. That didn't happen until 1951. But in 1950, the White Sox signed their first two Black players, um, Sam Hairston and Bob Boyd. Now, these guys were Negro League veterans, unlike the guys that the Cubs signed. Um, both were in their late 20s and had been around and played in the Negro Leagues for some time. And both guys were very good players and very successful. They were signed on the recommendation of a former Negro League pitcher named John Donaldson. Donaldson probably deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. In fact, I would say there's no question about it. He was, he was a great pitcher. But the White Sox, when, when Lane became interested in black players, he signed Donaldson as a, as a scout. And Donaldson recommended the signing of, of Boyd and Hairston. Um, so both were signed for the White Sox minor league teams in 1950, uh, they came to spring training with the Sox in 1951. <laughs> Hairston actually played with the White Sox in 1951. He was the second black player after Minoso with the White Sox, but the first African-American. He was a catcher. Uh, he was brought up when they had injuries toward the end of the 1951 season. <laughs> He got five at bats, he got two hits, so he retired as a four hundred hitter in the white major leagues and went back to the minor leagues where he, he basically spent the rest of his career. Um, Harrison was an incredible guy. Um, <clears throat> even though he never played again with the White Sox, he stayed with the team as a player, a scout, or as a coach for more than 50 years. He was actually coaching in his 70s in 1994 when the White Sox signed Michael Jordan. He's the patriarch of the Hairston dynasty, which included uh, Jerry Hairston, uh, John Hairston, Scott Hairston, a lot of Hairstons. <clears throat> there were 10 family members of the Hairston dynasty that were signed or drafted by professional baseball teams. <clears throat> Bob Boyd was a great hitter in the Negro Leagues, a great hitter in the white minor leagues, and a 298 hitter in the white major leagues. He never really got a chance to play much for the White Sox. <clears throat> but in 1956, when Paul Richards was managing the Orioles, he made a trade for Boyd, and the next year, at the age of 37, he gave Boyd the first base job, and Boyd was one of the best hitters in the American League that season. His career ended up a couple of years later, and he ended up driving a, a, a bus for a team, for, for a bus company that also had a semi-pro team, and Boyd said, he made as much money driving the bus and playing for the bus company team as he ever played in the major, as he ever made in the majors. 
1951, on April 30th, Frank Lane finally is able to arrange a trade with, with the Cleveland Indians to acquire Minnie Minoso. He makes his White Sox debut the next day on May 1st against the Yankees. He homers in his first at bat against Vic Rashi of the Yankees. Interestingly, there was another rookie for the Yankees who hit his first major league homer in the, in the same game, a guy named Mickey Mantle. Minoso is an immediate sensation with the White Sox. He goes crazy on the base pass. He becomes one of the leading hitters in the American League. The team, which had basically been a second division team since the end of the Black Sox scandal, takes over first place and holds it until well after the All-Star break. They draw a million fans for the first time in team history and set a team attendance record that won't be broken until Bill Vec buys the team in the late 1950s. When Yosa finishes fourth in the MVP rating race that year, he finished second, curiously, to Gil McDougall of the Yankees uh, in the Rookie of the Year voting. Uh, there may have been a little racial uh, gerrymandering done in that voting. Um, but at the same time, he endures frequent beatings. He leads the American League in hit by pitches for the first of many times in his career. Um, he's often taunted and thrown at by other major league teams. And uh, in one of his books, Minnie says that the team that was most eager to taunt him or throw at him were the Philadelphia Athletics, and their manager was Jimmy Dykes. While Minosa was breaking in to the, major, the white major leagues in 1951, he was given a big welcome. But that same summer, less than 10 miles away from Comiskey Park, a different sort of welcome was given to a black family that was simply trying to rent an apartment in the town of Cicero. Uh, the guy's name was Harvey Clark. He was a college graduate and a CTA bus driver. He and his family attempt to run an apartment in Cicero and the police don't let him come into the building. Uh, rioters gather outside. They basically torch the building so that Clark and his family cannot move in. <clears throat> the rioting is so bad that uh, Atlee Stevens, who is, who is governor of the, Atlee Stevens and governor of Illinois, has to call in the National Guard. And the Clarks are never able to move into that house, but they become kind of national heroes across the country because they continue to struggle for justice. And they actually fight a legal battle that lasted for six years that resulted in a cash settlement. Um, incredible family. He had two children, um, a six-year-old son and eight-year-old daughter. Um, the daughter and the son both became prominent Black television news people when they grew up. While all this is going on, Minnie is careful only to live on, this, on Chicago's south side, and that lasts for several years. <clears throat> He's unable to stay at the same hotel and his teammates in places like St. Louis. And when they're in spring training, many and his black teammates have to stay in the homes of black families in the area because the hotels are discriminating and won't allow black people to stay in the hotel. This went on for a long time into the 1960s. At the same time that the White Sox signed Minosa, they were interested in other Afro-Latino players, <laughs> the first two of whom were Luis Garcia and Hector Rodriguez. Um, 
Garcia was a, a dark-skinned Venezuelan infielder. Came from a, a remote area in Venezuela. Didn't speak English. Had a pregnant wife at, back home. Really uh, had a lot of culture shock uh, when he came to America for the first time. <clears throat> Actually left the team at one point to go home to be with his wife. Returned, was eventually signed to a minor league team by the White Sox. Um, when he struggles, he's quickly released. <clears throat> Garcia doesn't give up baseball. He signs with another minor league team where he plays for a couple of years and does very well. Uh, he then goes on to a long career in Latin America. Um, he's voted into the Caribbean Baseball Hall of Fame the Venezuelan Baseball Hall of Fame, the Latino Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, he's really a legend in Latin America, and in particular in his native country of Venezuela. Um, but really had an opportunity to play Major League Baseball with the White Sox has never got a chance. A year later, the, the Sox made a trade with the Brooklyn Dodgers and acquired a... Um, Black Cuban player named Hector Rodriguez from the Dodger farm system. Uh, he's considered a brilliant fielder, um, but and he, he plays for the White Sox for most of that year. Um, he hits 265 with no power, uh, but he's playing with injuries. Um, Minoso knows that he's playing hurt, but he's he's afraid to take himself out of the lineup. And as a, as a result, his play suffers and he's released by the White Sox. He too goes on to a long career, uh, mostly in Mexico, plays until he's mid forties um, and becomes a very distinguished player. I talked to a, a Cuban a baseball historian named Roberto Gonzalez Echevarria, who's written a long history of Cuban baseball. And he, he described um, Rodriguez as a superb fielding first baseman, but he was black. Major league teams had his had their quotas. He should have been in the majors during that time, but he wasn't. This happened to a lot of guys. 1952, the White Sox, again through John Donaldson, their black scout, uh, signed um, a Negro League pitcher Connie Johnson, um, he had been with the Kansas City Monarchs um, as early as his teenage years. He actually broke into the Negro Leagues in 1940 at age 17. In 1940, he was part of a really legendary Kansas City Monarchs team that had two Hall of Famers, Satchel Page and Hilton Smith on their pitching staff. Um, another future Hall of Famer, um, who's the guy, Willard Brown, uh, was also on that team, uh, briefly played with the St. Louis Browns, a real powerhouse team. Um, so Connie Johnson is signed by the White Sox. He's assigned to their, it was a Class C farm team in Colorado Springs in 1952. And they he's with um, Sam Harrison, the, the only black players on the team, and about the only black players in the Western League. They're playing against the team from Omaha, and they basically go through with what Jackie Robinson went through with the Philadelphia Phillies and Ben Chapman in 1947, where the entire team led by the manager is showing racial taunts at the players, knowing the players can't do anything about it and kind of trying to make life miserable for them. <clears throat> Colorado Springs stood by their black players. They prote protested to the league. Uh, the league stood by them as well and it, the taunting ended, but I'm sure Connie Johnson um, 
never forgot about that. He finally makes his debut with the White Sox in 1953, but he doesn't get a chance to pitch for the White Sox until 1956 when he's traded to the Orioles <clears throat> along with Bob Boyd, uh, with Paul Richards being the man who wanted them on his team. He has a great year in his mid-30s in 1957, but he has a somewhat difficult relationship with Paul Richards. He says of Richards, I don't think he liked blacks very much. I actually talked to um, Warren Conrad, who wrote a biography of Richards. And Richards was a Texan. And Richards felt that he understood black, black people because Southerners lived with them. But his attitude toward black people was okay with him, but it wasn't necessarily okay with the people on the other end. But to his credit, whatever prejudices he felt, if somebody was a good ball player, Richards ultimately, when he had the power, gave them a chance to play. And both Bob Boyd and Connie Johnson got, got their chance to play with the Orioles very late in their baseball lives. But when they got a chance to play, they did well. And when Paul Richards died, Warren Corbett told, told me that um, despite their mixed feelings about Richards, um, they called Richards' home and gave their console, condolences to his family. Uh, also, Buck O'Neill uh, talked about Kenny Johnson and said he was a great pitcher, could have won 20, probably could have, pitch, could have pitched in the white major leagues in the 1940s, but uh, he was a, one of those guys for whom it just came too late. On the Cubs side, uh, one of the first black players they signed was Gene Baker. Gene was an auto... Uh, he was a, an Iowa native, uh, went to an integrated high school, big basketball star, um, signed to play with the Kansas City Monarchs, played with the Monarchs under Buck O'Neill for a couple of years. And with Buck's recommendation, uh, he was purchased by the Cubs in 1950. He went to spring training with the Springfield team, Cubs farm team in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, made the team and eventually ended up with, with the Cubs main farm team, the Los Angeles Angels in the Pacific Coast League <clears throat> later that year, but was probably ready for the major leagues as soon as 1950 or 1951. But they kept them down there for four seasons. <clears throat> People kept praising Gene Baker for his play while Cubs sources are quietly undermining him and giving excuses why he's not ready for the major leagues. Um, sometimes they're saying Gene could feel really well. He was a shortstop at the time, but uh, he needs to work on his hitting. And when his hitting improved, they said, well, Gene really needs to work on his fielding. And at the time, the Cubs had a shortstop named Ray Smalley. And uh, Sam Lacey, the great black sports writer, said Gene couldn't do worse than Ray Smalley if he tried batting with a pencil. <laughs> but he stayed, <laughs> he stayed in Los Angeles. Finally, in September of 1953, Baker makes his Cub debut along with Banks. I'll talk a little bit more about his experience with Banks and the Cubs. But he ends up playing nine years in the white majors. Um, a really talented player, a really smart player. Uh, I talked to people like um, Vern Law, who had played with Baker with the 1960 Pirates. Uh, it was really at the end of, of Gene's baseball career. But he talked about uh, what a leader Gene was and what a positive influence he was in the clubhouse for a world championship team. Um, he's, so he's praised both for his baseball skills 
<clears throat> and his leadership skills. After his playing career ends, he becomes a manager in the minor leagues and becomes the first black manager of a white minor league team with Batavia, Pirates Farm Team, in 1961. He, after that, becomes a coach on Danny Murtaugh's team with the Pirates in for a couple of years. In 1963, when Murtaugh gets thrown out of a game, Murtaugh asks Baker to manage the team for the rest of the game. So unofficially, Gene Baker was actually the first black person who managed the team in the white major leagues. Um, he eventually retired as a coach, but he spent 23 years as a pirate scout. And he was a highly regarded person, man, player, coach, manager for the rest of his life. So in 1953, um, Baker broke in with Arnie Banks. Now, Banks had grown up in, in Dallas, and he had signed with the Kansas City Monarchs Toward the end, of, toward the time when the Monarchs and the Negro Leagues were in serious decline, so he played for the Monarchs in 1950, was drafted into the military service, spent two years in the um, in the army, um, came back to the minors in 1953, and was scouted by a number of major league teams, and on the recommendation of Buck O'Neill was purchased by the Cubs. Interestingly, another team that scouted Ernie Banks was the White Sox under John Donaldson, who was still their chief scout in, in uh, looking for black players. Donaldson told Frank Lane, you got to sign this guy. Lane instead relied on a negative scouting report from one of his white scouts and let Banks go to the Cubs. Donaldson was so devastated and upset about this that he quit his job with the White Sox and never worked for them again. <clears throat> so Banks makes his debut with the Cubs late in 1953. Baker would have broken in at the same time, but he was injured. So Baker didn't make his debut uh, until three days later. They become the Cubs shortstop, second base combination, um, and really are, are successful really right from the start. Um, some people have their doubts, um, one of them being Jimmy Dykes again, who, who is now managing the Baltimore Orioles and makes a bet with a sports writer that Banks won't hit 250 and he'll be out of the National League by August. Well, I think we know what happened there. Banks ends up second in the Rookie of the Year voting in 1954. He becomes a legitimate superstar in 1955 and goes on to a fabulous career and Hall of Fame career winning on two Hall of Fame, two Most Valuable Player Awards in 58 and 59. <clears throat> Banks and Baker, for whatever reason, became known in Chicago as Bingo and Bango. So Banks was Bingo and Baker was Bango. And they had a first baseman named Steve Bilko. So the double play combination was Bingo to Banco to, Bil to Bilko. Anyway, Bilko wasn't very good, but Banks and Baker were. As Minoso broke in at the same time that there was a lot of racial controversy and rioting in Chicago, the same thing happened when Bank, at the time that Banks broke in in 1953, at a public housing project called the Trumbull Park Homes on the far south side of Chicago. This rioting broke out. <clears throat> when a white-skinned black woman tried to rent 
an apartment in a building that was run by the Chicago Housing Authority, run by the city. <clears throat> and because they assumed she was white, they let her move in. And with when her and her husband found out that they were black, the place went crazy. <clears throat> Time Magazine actually wrote an article about this in the spring of 1954, when the disturbance still hadn't gone down. It actually lasted for a couple of years. And the couple who were named Donald and Betty Howard ended up uh, moving out of the building. Um, other black residents stayed in the building and, and fought to stay there and eventually succeeded. Banks and Baker played for a team on the north side of the city, but they were expected to live on the south side, and they did. And they were isolated from the rest of their teammates, basically, you know, all of whom were white. And <clears throat> one of the biographers of Banks talked to some of their teammates. And one of the guys said, we didn't socialize them away from the park. Another one said, I really don't know what they did after games. They were kind of a world to themselves, unfortunately. That's what they had to put up with in order to succeed. The last two players I'll talk about in the major leagues were Sam Jones and Earl Batty. <clears throat> Sam Jones was, was a Negro League pitcher um, who pitched in the late 1940s. He was signed by the Cleveland Indians, uh, actually broke in with the Indians, I think in 1951. Um, had some problems, had a sore arm, uh, eventually went back down to the minors. And uh, uh, the Cubs made a deal with the Indians prior to the 1955 season. And uh, Sam joined the team in 1955. On May 12th, he threw the first no-hitter by a black pitcher in the white major leagues uh, against the Pittsburgh Pirates. <clears throat> Very dramatic game. He walks the bases loaded in the ninth inning and then strikes out Dick Rowe, Roberto Clemente, and Frank Thomas to end the game. Um, he, he goes on to a short but very good National League career, uh, finishes second in the Cy Young voting, in 1959. Um, unfortunately, Sam Jones dies at an early age. He's still pitching in the minors when he dies of cancer at the age of 45 in 1971. Finally, we have Earl Batty. Um, Earl Batty, interestingly, he was the first American-born Black player signed by the Cubs or the White Sox who hadn't come in through the Negro Leagues. Batty had grown up in Los Angeles in an integrated neighborhood and uh, lived in a racially mixed environment. And uh, when he was assigned to the Colorado Springs team where Sam Harrison and Connie Johnson had had so much trouble, um, he was shocked to find out what Jim Crow was like, even in the Western League, not in the South in 1953. Um, Batty played several years in with the White Sox, uh, mostly behind Sherm Lawler. Uh, he reached his great, greatest fame after the White Sox traded him to the Minnesota Twins. Actually, they were the Senators when he was traded, but uh, he was a four-time All-Star and really one of the key players of the 1965 Minnesota team, Minnesota Twins team that won the, won the pennant. Um, I talked to Jim Cott, um, who'll be at the Sabre convention about Earl Batty and, and Jim raved about not only what a great teammate was, Jim Earl Batty was, but what a great batter roommate was, he was, and how well they worked together. Great guy, Earl Batty. But let's not forget the black players who never reached the, the white major leagues. Um, there were a lot, of, a lot of players who played in the White Sox farm system, the Cubs farm system, other major league farm system. They not only didn't reach the major leagues, but whatever their talent level were, was, a lot of them never even came close. Um, 
one of the old Negro League players who had come up with the White Sox farm team was a guy named Gene, Gene Collins. He referred to himself and his black teammates as window dressing, meaning, in other words, they were on a team to show that they were at least paying some service to having black players at least on their minor league teams. <clears throat> The team in the picture was was a team in Danville, Illinois, called the Danville Dans. They had three black players on their opening day lineup, and they had nine black players on the team over the course of the season. Um, pretty interesting team. Uh, the most interesting was a guy named Jim Zapp, a former Negro leaguer who had played with the Birmingham Black Barons in 1948, when Willie Mace, who was then 17 years old, was coming up. And Jim Zapp uh, had a great relationship with him. And, and, er and Willie said he was like a big brother to me. And reflecting on his baseball career, Jim Zapp said, if I had been a white boy, ain't nothing would have held me back. And I think he was right, and I think that was true. A lot of of a lot of the black players of this period, earlier, and later. So finally, let's come back to Ernie and Minnie, uh, a black Chicago sports writer named Fred Mitchell wrote about Ernie Banks. Ernie was on a, en route to a Hall of Fame career in the late 1950s. Yet there are restaurants in America where he was turned away. Establishments he could not frequent, houses he could not rent or purchase because of the color of his skin. If he was hurting inside, Banks never showed it, but he certainly felt it inside. And finally, a tribute to Minnie Minoso from the great Orlando Cepeda, who passed away last week. And Orlando said, Minnie Minoso is to Latin American player, Latin players, what Jackie Robinson was to black ball players. As much as I loved Roberto Clemente and cherish his memory, Minnie is the one who made it possible for all us Latins. Before Roberto Clemente, before Vic Power, before Orlando Cepeda, there was Minnie Minoso. Thank you very much. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Don. Much appreciated. Um, look forward to seeing you in, in Minneapolis. Uh, Thank you. You know, along with the rest of you guys. Um, Anybody have questions for Dawn? Uh, we know this book's not coming out until sometime next year, but uh, you know he's a man who definitely knows his stuff and, and has the, the pedigree and the background in, in this. So we'll open it up to uh, any questions or comments. Go ahead, Bill. Don, Don, I have one question just out of curiosity. <laughs> the team in Danville that you cited in 1953, uh, did, did it have a, a good, really good record? No, they were last place team. <clears throat> they finished in last place. Oh, they did? Yeah, what happened with these black players was that they brought them in for one reason or another and never kept them on the team. There are probably never more than three or four of them on the team at one time. But Jim Zapp, the guy that they talked about, that I talked about, he stayed with the team for about two weeks. They found a buyer for him and they sold him. Um, that was uh, very typical of, of what went on. Uh, you know, they were <clears throat> they were they were looking to look good, and they were also looking to make a buck. Mm -hmm. What what became of Zap later on when he after he was sold? Yeah, <clears throat> you know, he he actually had several great years <clears throat> in the low minors. You can look at his career on uh, baseballreference.com because they have his minor league stats for like 53, 54. And it, it was the low minor leagues, but he put up some fearsome numbers, believe me. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Good presentation, very thank thorough. You.
Sorry, Dan. Say, Dan. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for um, including the um, information about uh, Trumbull Park and and Cicero because that really helped um, in the background of what um, uh, Chicago and um, you know black players were dealing with at that time. Um, I was I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, I was born in 1950, so um, even though I don't remember those incidents exactly, though you know I I. I was certainly very much aware of the racial situation in Chicago growing up. But one thing I noticed is when you mentioned um, um, Wrigley and, and the Cubs and Wrigley Field, of course, uh, we're, I, was, I was aware of the um, East-West All-Star game being played at Comiskey and the uh, um, history of black baseball being played there. But um, how many uh, um, um, black major league games were played at Wrigley Field because that would have been a time when Black certainly wouldn't have been welcomed on the south side. Was um, P.K. Wrigley, I, I imagine he would have been pretty nervous about um, hosting Black baseball games on the north side there. Yeah, you know, I, I talked to Ed Hardick, who's the Cubs official historian. He told me that between 42 and 45, there were about two dozen games played at Wrigley. Now, usually it was like big ticket games, so like if somebody like Satchel Page was going to pitch or uh, one of the better Negro League teams like the Monarchs was going to play there. And they had a lot of Black people who came up from the South Side to attend the game. And surprisingly, there were no incidents at these games. Um, there were no problems um, that really I could find anybody writing about. Um, it actually went pretty well. And uh, you know, as I say, as I said in the presentation, <clears throat> Wrigley made a lot of money out of the appearances of Satchel Page in 1942, and probably would have kept up with it if this uh, fight and brawl in the stands hadn't broken out at Negro the game in '45. That kind of turned him off to the whole team, and he really kind of went the other direction uh, <clears throat> after Robinson signed uh, with the Dodgers. In 1946, Larry McPhail tried to put together, he put together a document um, on why black players should be kept out of Major League Baseball. It was a lot of stuff about, you know, how it's going to hurt our attendance and how it, our white fans are not going to be comfortable with this. And he presented this document <clears throat> to the commissioner and he had three helpers um, putting together this document. And two of the people who signed off on it were Tom Yockey and Phil Wrigley. Um, huh. Wrigley was kind of, he was kind of a strange cat. You know, I, I, I do think, I, I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. I think his heart may have been in the right place, but, you know, talk is cheap. You got to act as well. Yeah, because Wrigley's name just never come. I, I, you just never see it mentioned, you know, in other writings when during during that period, um, uh, when uh, you know the debate among owners um, uh, comes up over uh, black players in the majors. Well, I mean, most of them just this went along. I mean, the White Sox ownership was the same way. They they didn't they didn't specifically speak out against it, but they do they did nothing. To help it either. Yeah. Another thing that I wrote about, this is interesting, I wrote about it in the book. In 1947, when Robinson broke in, <clears throat> there was this like strike talk that I'm I'm sure most people have read about. Um with talk um apparently put together by Dixie Walker of trying to boycott games that Jackie Robinson played in to force him out of out of baseball. <clears throat> For the most part, I think it was just talk. But <clears throat> like I think on the it was like the 40th or 50th anniversary, something like that, of, of Robinson's debut, ESPN actually tried to contact all the black, all the all the nationally players who were in the league in 1947. 
and who are still alive and asked them about this petition talk. And several of them said the talk was actually fairly serious. It's just that they didn't have enough support. But the interesting thing was that one of the teams that had the most support for boycotting Jackie Robinson was the Cubs because they had several black players and they did not want Robinson in the league. And if there had been a real serious strike attempt, they would have gladly gone along with it. That's a shame, but it's true. Uh, huh. I, I wanted to comment. Uh, the First of all, excellent presentation. Uh, I grew up in Chicago um, during the days when even before uh, Banks and Baker uh, integrated the Cubs and many minute and also integrated the White Sox. Um, Roy Smalley was not quite as bad as that looked. He hit 21 homers one one year. Yes, he did. But yes. that was probably his only good year. <clears throat> um, uh, it, as I heard this presentation, it strikes me there are probably other teams other cities uh, that probably are just as problematic, if not worse, certainly Boston, in terms of bringing Black players along and giving them an opportunity. Um, it's, it's certainly, it's not a proud record as to how long it took to, to bring uh, Black players in to these two franchises. But I, yeah, I, I think, think the there, I suspect there are a number of others where you could oh, do yeah. a similar kind of book. Yeah. Yeah, I write quite a bit about Detroit in the book. Um, Detroit was very problematical. <clears throat> you know, a city like Chicago, that had a huge Black population, and also a fairly substantial um, history of, of Black participation in, in athletics, including in the Negro Leagues, and uh, the Tigers' ownership under the Briggs family was very hostile to the idea of, of integration and really had to be led kicking and spring, screaming into into adding a black player. And they were the second to last team to integrate before yeah. the Red Sox. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Well, Don, we appreciate your time. Um, Know the time difference is not easy to adjust to. So um, about 8.15 here on the East Coast. Um, Orioles game will be on, I think, 10 o'clock tonight because it's uh, at Seattle. And um, I will uh, send out messages with the upcoming events, uh, as always. I uh, look forward to seeing several of you guys uh, a little over a month, I guess, in, in, in Minneapolis. Um, if you need anything in the meantime, feel free to reach out. And Francis, uh, we hope you feel better, buddy, and we're going to miss you next month. So Okay, well, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Hopefully, uh, I'll be progressing. It's just uh, got to be on the disabled list this year. Okay. <laughs> we've, we've, we've all been there. So Yeah, yeah. Um, so Don, again, appreciate it. Thanks for a great presentation. Um, I'm a Cubs fan, uh, after the Orioles. So I, I really enjoyed hearing some of this stuff. Um, Thank you. Thanks, everybody. and, uh, even though I'm not from Chicago, um, so we, uh, we appreciate it here at the BBRC and, uh, guys, everybody has a, a safe holiday tomorrow. Um, enjoy time <laughs> off, time away. And we'll, uh, See you guys at the next event. So much appreciated. Good evening. Thank you. Yeah. See you in Minneapolis uh, next month.